transitions in the energy sector. From 2013 to 18, he's been working on pioneering research into implementation, energy systems, and economic analysis, while remaining involved in policy development implement, implementation at national and local government levels. I'm certain that Hilton will be able to give us an up-to-date on some of the aspects of the energy debate in our country. Thanks, Thank you. Okay, so I didn't know how many people I'd be speaking to or who you would be. So I just want to get a quick idea. Uh, we've only got an hour, and it's a huge subject. So um, I'll tell you why it's a huge subject in a minute. But I just want to get an idea. Who of you did science at school? Wow. Okay, that's fantastic. I can tell I'm talking to a slightly older crowd. Because these days, no, I promise you, I talk to the faces, and I'm as old as you, so... Um, I'm talking about three people put up there. Who's an actual engineer? Okay, economists, people in environmental work, lawyers, who cares about the environment? Okay, that's quite good, the last one as well. Okay, so we've got an hour. As Rose, we'll see from my uh, CV. I used to be a proper engineer for about 10 years, up until 1990. And then I've been working in a vexed area it's called policy development, which is where you engage with government and big players, and you try and get them to change what they've been doing. I'm sorry. You try and get them to change what they've been doing. I actually prefer it without the microphone. Okay. Keep it on. Okay, good. So what I've been doing for the past 28 years is working a lot with government, but still with companies, etc. And what we're particularly interested in, beginning of the 90s, what we were really interested in was, in those days, about 30% of South Africans had access to electricity at home, and our economy was dominated by a large mining sector. And in fact, by 90, coal had overtaken gold as our biggest export by far. So we had this economy with a lot of people with hot electricity and we sitting on a pile of coal. Um, just jumping to the world, um, who of you read The Guardian online? So it's about half of you. Who is aware that there are a whole lot of really serious mainstream people like the United States Secretary General, and doctors and uh, presidents and CEOs even of oil companies that think that there's a huge environmental crisis. One or two of you are aware? Okay. Have you, anybody heard of climate change? Okay. Uh, how many of you here think that if we continue on our current trajectory, uh, within about 20 to 30 years it will be inevitable that we, the uh, amount of emissions that we've pushed into the atmosphere then will push the Earth into really dangerous dimensions of climate change. So a lot of you believe that. So just a little bit of background. As I said, this is a huge subject. The thing about climate change is the stuff we push, the, the, the carbon dioxide that we've pushed into the air until now um, has already used up more than half of our carbon budget. Also, populations have grown. Economies have grown, China, India, uh, some Africa's, uh, South America. So with this rapid economic growth, if uh, the energy system that we've got at the moment, if we don't change it radically, we will push so much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere in the next 10 or 20 years that because of what are called lags, and you all, a lot of you are scientists and did science, you'll know that because of lags, by the time you, we're trying to do something, it'll be too late. So the, the talk on transitions to green energy happen in an environment where, on the one hand, I want to persuade you, because this is the work we do all the time, that we run engineering models, economic models, resource models that show that it is techno-economically. So, we have the technology today 
We have the finances, we have the economic instruments. It is techno-economically possible to do what we have to do, which is for the rich countries to fully decarbonize their energy systems in about 10 to 15 years, and for the poor companies to peak in terms of their emission from fossil fuel energy and to start going down quickly so that we can avert this crisis. So I could easily have spent the whole day showing you our technological models and telling you things like wind power is now cheaper than fossil power. PV panels are cheaper, the big price debate. And that's what a lot of technology companies will come and tell you to do, and I agree with them. But it's kind of a, it's almost like a religious debate because you have people on the other side saying it's impossible, it's this, it's that, etc. So that's one lecture I could have given. The other lecture, and this is the one that I, I've, I've got in, in my notes here, what I do is I go and look into the history of energy because it's, even though technology is a wonderful thing, those people that study what are called science and technology studies, there's a thing called transition management. The people that study that are finding that our, tech, our transitions are bound much more up in a complex interaction of social, technological, economic, and financial factors. It's not just, is there a technology that can solve it? We'll slap it in and we'll solve it. So, how many of you know that our emissions went up last year, greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and that there's quite a lot of, uh, what's the word, uh, despair around. There's, there's a whole study now called the psychology of transitions, particularly major transitions involving uh, environmental collapse. Who knows that we think we might be in the sixth mass extinction as well? And these things, so there's a whole other area of transitions, studying this, the, what people do with, when they're presented with something that actually makes them despair. And what they typically do, they do two things. They either go into denial, which is a very functional psychological process. That's part of many failed transitions. So, you know, in the 1930s in Europe, when people said, look what's happening with uh, Bolshevism and Nazism, National Socialism, a whole lot of people just went into denial, and we saw what happened. There have been a whole lot of ex similar examples since the study of the decline of the Roman Empire, which took a long time. So there's that whole side, history, denial. So people go into denial, which is very functional. We need that to, to function as people, or they go into grief. And... Uh, the second, uh, uh, and there's an excellent book by Joanna Macy on this. I, I recommend it. She's written about three books. Um, but she says, at least with grief, what we do, and most of us here by now know that overcoming losses, at least if you see the loss, you'll start overcoming it and you'll do something about it because you go through a grieving process. I'm not going to take you through a grieving process today, but you'll see part of what I'm going to tell you is about not me just arriving here as, which I'd also like to do, as an exponent of huge techno-optimism and telling you, don't worry, we've got the technology, we've got the money, it's just a matter of you guys going and voting for the right political party or joining Greta Thunberg with her climate strike. Okay, so that's my introduction. So, but just to summarize, I'm stuck. On the one hand, I could give you this big optimistic spiel because I want you to go and get out there and force this green energy transition to happen, to become part of it. Um, and to do that, I've got to tell you, it's really possible. Just believe me on that one, like a priest, okay? I'm an engineer and an economist, etc. And then we'll go and look at some of the facts. So that's on the one side. On the other side, I've I've got the story showing you that, in fact, very little is happening. Um, and as an academic and as you know, speaking at the university, etc., I feel I've got to tread between those two. Um, so let's just dive in here. Those are the lectures for the rest of the week. Um, we'll be looking over all the transitions today and then very specific aspects uh, around... Uh, technology and transitions in Africa. I just want to quickly talk about this thing. It's so important being in South Africa and Africa. So once again, I could give a days-long talk on saying, 
In Africa, there are 1 billion of us. 600 million of us don't have access to electricity. So if I, believe, it, I could take a whole other tack and say the energy transition that we should really be interested in is getting some kind of acceptable energy to 600 million people that don't, and also to tell you that all the population projections show that by uh, uh, 2020, and at the end of this century, there'll be 2 billion Africans who all need energy. So that could be a talk all in its own. So the energy development in Africa, Vickers will tell you about that. Um, so the coming transitions. So a transition, it's, there's, there's a whole transitions literature which has sprung up. There used to be hardly anything about 20 years ago. If you do a search in these academic search engines now, you'll find that there are now thousands of academic papers coming out every year on transitions. You can imagine how the academics have got their teeth into this. So a transition can be a movement from one relatively stable system state to another. So this is the kind of normal transitions that uh, we know about. So the transition, say, with cell phones, the, self, the transition from a landline to the first cell phone, so as Nokia was in, in the mid-90s, you moved from one phone to another kind of phone. That's a transition, one kind of transition. But a more significant tr transition, and this is the kinds of transitions that we think have to happen in energy systems, the green energy transition, isn't just the same functionality with a different inside that you don't really notice or you can carry around. That's more like the transition from the old landline to the new phones, which you can open up your phone, see, ah, oh, I feel like this, push a button, and two days later, DHL delivers something from you know, the other side of the world. Even in South Africa, that happens. So that's not a landline turning into a phone. It's still called a phone, but that is the complete and utter transformation of the whole information system of the world so that you can connect and financial system of the world and commercial system of the world so you can find out somebody selling something in Vietnam or China and have it on your desk in three days. So transitions vary quite a lot. And if you read a lot of the literature, the kind of transition that we are thinking will happen in the energy system if it happens. And there's another important thing. It transitions, there, there's somebody called Joseph Schumpeter. He was one of the, f the first people that really under, uh, studied transitions in the 1940s. He had a, a concept called creative destruction. And he did very formal studies. And what he found in the past, and then theoretically, was before transitions, all the transitions that have happened, Nobody knew what was going to happen. If you asked the people in the 80s about cell phones, they wouldn't have known. If you asked the people in 1870 about motor vehicles or electricity, they would have had no idea. If you asked the people in the 1600s about the Industrial Revolution, they would have had no idea. It's very difficult for us sitting with our fancy computers and everything, sitting here. And if I say to you, I'm sorry, but the kind of transitions that we're talking about that are going to happen in this next century, theoretically, we've got these philosophers that can show us we actually don't have any idea, which makes them, on the one hand, really exciting, on the other hand, very scary. Okay. And then, so that's transition and transformation. And then there's this thing called transition management. And this is where all the academic work is going and a lot of the policy work at the moment. Because we do think and it's funny how humans have always thought they're on top of things. Ask them in the 30s, ask them in the 1870s, ask them in 1600, ask Pliny, ask Cicero. They would have all thought that they were on top of things. You know, look at our wonderful aqueducts and roads and legal system and uh, Roman legions. No army can ever defeat us. Ask the Egyptian pharaohs. So, but what we're, so I'm just, what I'm trying to do in this is lectures, not get stuck in technology and whatever, but make you really think deeply and talk about these things. There's brilliant stuff written on it. So what we're trying to do because of ecological collapse, what we're trying to do because of the large number of people in the world and because we think we know everything again, like the Romans and the Greeks, is 
we're trying to come up with a deliberate attempt to bring about a long-term change in a stepwise manner because we don't know how to do disruption very well. Or we think we do. Don't. Um, and that brings me to the last idea in transitions, which is disruption. Disruption is what it is. It's disruption. You, something comes in from the outside, and nobody predicted it, or those people that did were wrong, and bang, everything changes. So that's an important concept in transitions. So that's overall transition stuff. So I'll just give you an example here. I don't know if this is a transition or a transformation or if there was disruption. This is a picture of Fifth Avenue in 1900. And over here, it's not that clear, but I'll tell you that I've looked at a better resolution picture of this. These are all uh, horse-drawn carriages, and that's a car. And this is from a character called Tommy Sieber. I recommend this video very highly. Google him. And over here, there is one car in 1900 in Fifth Avenue. Many of you, you might have... Who's seen this video, by the way? Tony Sieber, you've seen it. So, um, and then 13 years later, where's the horse-drawn carriage? And there's one. So, um, and what he, Tony Sieber, says is... We're sitting now, um, not with one disruption, but we're sitting with five or six, five disruptions, they're more, but he, he says at least five disruptions. Each one of these technology, geez, he says, could disrupt our energy system fundamentally. So if we choose anyone, electric vehicles, You'll see later that oil is still the biggest energy, primary energy supply in the world, and most emissions still come from it. Everybody talks about coal and electricity, and when you say energy, all we think is about electricity. Well, energy is actually about those internal combustion engines, which are 25% efficient. And then you will also have read that China last year, for the first time, uh, their internal combustion engine uh, vehicle sales peaked. They started going down, and electric vehicles are taking over. Some people, crazy people, are saying by 2030, it'll, they'll only be selling electric vehicles in China. Now, you can imagine China is probably the biggest oil user. And in energy systems, in 10 years, we could have a similar thing to Tony Sieber's Fifth Avenue thing. But we don't know. So we're on the brink. The, the EV thing, electric vehicle thing, they're, they're very few in South Africa at the moment. Five years ago, if you try to tell anybody seriously in government or whatever that you've got a plan for EVs, they would have said, forget it, 2050. Now we're looking at, at uh, you will, you'll know some of this, I don't want to get too much into the technology, but by 2030 we could be only making EVs in the world because a cheap Chinese electric vehicle costs less than any internal combustion engine vehicle from any other country because of their magnificent manufacturing capabilities. So I'm not going to go over all of those. If we did, we'd be here for the day. We've just got an hour. But there are five technologies. Okay, so these are conceptual things. Just another very important conceptual thing. Energy transitions. So the way I like to define them is that one way of defining them is that is a fundamental change in what we call the prime mover or the technology. Across 2,000 years or longer, we started off with one human, so we can only push out 100 watts in a sustained way. Lance Armstrong, is it Armstrong? The cyclist. It wasn't the astronaut. It was Neil. Um, Lance Armstrong can push out 650 watts you know, for a couple of minutes. But we can only put out 100 watts. Um, the pyramids were built with 100 human or bigger teams, and apparently a whole lot of them could come up with 8 kilowatts for a short time to move a really big stone. Um, so that's an 100 kilowatt brief exertion. That 100 kilowatt there is, that's like a Golf GTI. Um, so for the whole of, of uh, history, um, until people started using animals for plowing, which was only about uh, 3,000 years ago, 
you had 100 watts maximum. Hunter-gatherers didn't use animals. As soon as we had, sorry, 12,000 years ago, we started with pastoral agriculture. So then for a long time, from about 12,000 years ago till about uh, the um, 2,000 years ago, small bovine and was the, the most energy we had. I'm just trying to give you an idea for numbers. Then by um, about uh, 200, 300, we managed to put 500 watts into a team of horses. Um, but the interesting thing about this, because we're talking about energy, is that all of these, impro these, very, these important improvements here were used in farming, and the farming was used for energy, and energy was used for animals and people. So they're essentially energy used for energy production, which is a very interesting... People farmed mainly to get calories. They didn't used to do it for vitamins. So <laughs> in, in societies for very many years, the whole advance of society was limited by the number of calories they could get to a person per day. So the increase in population, which is why it didn't increase. Um, so it sped up farm work for more word, more uh, food for more energy. Um, by 277 BCE, so that's a, you know, 2,000 years ago, water wheels had developed, and they could produce two kilowatts. Those are those vertical water wheels. You know the ones that's like a spoke like that, and turns. So that was two kilowatts. Um, and very interestingly. Um, they were the first machines to spread wisely. And if anybody wants to write, uh, read an excellent paper on the, that condenses all this history, it's by somebody called Vaclav Smil, S-M-I-L. And it's available on the internet. Um, and it took all the way to 1700 that these were the only machines that had upped the amount of energy. And it, it had only got to four kilowatts. Remember I said a Golf GTI is 100 kilowatts? So it's about 40 people or a, 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 um, a team of very strong horses. And interesting, once again, it was mainly for grain milling and water pumping for agriculture. Um, so once again, they were using this only energy, only big energy uh, technology for producing energy, calories, carbohydrates, grains, wheat, etc. Then, all of a sudden, Newcomen arrived with his steam engine, and he got about 20 kilowatts out of it. They were massive things. And then James Watt, about 60 years later, were the very clever steam engine, which in 100 years, because of, it's interesting, people think that, oh, this is one of my hobby horses, but it's also an important thing in transitions. James Watt, um, patented his, his fancy governor on his steam engine around about 1769. And the patent held because there was very good intellectual property uh, rights management in England at the time because England was the empire and they managed IP. Basically, steam engines stayed very much the same until the patents on James Watt steam engine expired. And then all of a sudden, there was a massive... Uh, development in steam engines, and by 1870, you'd got a one megawatt, in other words, an order of magnitude better steam engine. And um, from then on, it just exploded, and you'll see these are big numbers, one megawatt to one gigawatt. So that's one billion watts, that's one million watts, that's 20,000 watts, that's 4,000 watts. All of, from 1700 to 2100, you had this huge increase in energy uh, production capabilities of the prime mover. Okay, that's the five minute version of the whole history of energy. Which, but it's just nice to, it's, and there's a graph here. So we kick off with a person at about 100 and that stays very much the same and then suddenly there's the industrial revolution and you get steam engines, water turbines. Oh, by the way, these water turbines, I didn't mention them, those are hydroelectric dams. So round about um, the beginning of last century, 
we learned to build big hydro dams, but before that we didn't. So, and then these are steam turbines, and we get one gigawatt at the top. Okay, moving on. So if we're interested in energy transitions, a lot of people study these. There are many papers and books on this. And they all came to a similar conclusion. They said they're very complicated and they take a long time. Even these ones take a long time, the Industrial Revolution ones. So from uh, James Watt in 1769, it takes 100 years, and then 100 years are, are long times. Before that, it took a very long time. So going back to the beginning of this lecture, we're talking about if we don't do something in 10, 20, or 30 years, there's a lot of trouble. So is it possible? I think this is a very important question. Is it possible? Or well, the other question is, what do we have to do to make it possible? Because the alternative is uh, really, really, really unpleasant. So those are two questions that we have to ask about transitions. Um, so this is from a paper by somebody called Benjamin Sovacool from 2014. And he, he, he asked us very, he's, and he's one of the world eminent energy and policy experts, technology, economics, etc. cetera. Um, he's been writing for about 20 years. And he went and he looked, he asked this question, how long do energy transitions take? And he gave two answers. He said, they take incredibly long, that's his words, or they happen quite quickly. Classic academic answer. <laughs> because it generates a whole lot more research. But no, um, cynicism aside, um, so the paper holds that both sides are partly right and partly wrong. So what is it about transitions that might make them happen fast and might uh, uh, make them take a long time? So that's one of the questions we should be asking ourselves. Um, I won't necessarily give you the answers, but I can in the discussion section discuss those. So one of the interesting transitions that happened was this transition to electricity. So remember earlier on we were talking about prime movers being one definition of, of, of a transition. But another definition of a transition is that you have a whole system. You, you don't have a change in the system, but you have a change of the system. So electricity is this very different thing that came along from burning coal or having stronger and stronger machines. It was this thing that you put onto wires and it could be everywhere at the same time. And um, interestingly, Faraday, even though he, in 1830, proved the basic science, he was the one that had the magnets and the, the coil of wire and you move the coil of wire and the magnets and out comes electricity. It took until about 1880, 50 years, until Thomas Edison connected a steam engine to an electric dynamo and sold electricity for the first time. He tried batteries before. You will have heard all these stories about Thomas Edison and batteries. Anyway, five years later, Nikola, Nicholas, Nikola Tesla, and one of the limiting things with Edison was that his dynamo was a direct current uh, system. Tesla came along, alternating current, not getting too much into these, but the thing about alternating current is it can go a far way without losses. So what you get is in just one decade, you get the ability when you combine what was happening in steam engines, in other words, a lot of concentrated power in one place, and what's happening in electricity transmission systems, that's uh, Nikola Tesla, that you can just take it everywhere, all of a sudden you can create a huge amount of mechanical energy in one place, turn it into electricity, and have it all over. And so we get what's called the second industrial revolution. So 20 or 30 years later, if you look at, say, the, the, the development of motor vehicle manufacturing or all manufacturing, what you have all of a sudden is the replacement in factories of people with motors. So just these little motors all over the place just spread into factories. You also get, but it wasn't as big a revolution, 
um, for people because uh, you can't really use movies to use the example, but in 1870, before this, if you went into the countryside or you were in cities and you went into people's houses at night, there were candles, gas lamps, etc., etc. So light wasn't the big uh, revolution. Similarly, they, um, they could get around in their cars, so it wasn't really a, a, a radical transition, having motor cars. So this is why the first industrial revolution was those steam engines that were involved in manufacturing, but the second one was it changed the face of mass manufacturing. You could have these little motors spread through factories throughout the world. So this is an example of a very, very fast transition. Um, and it's a, tr a radical transition because it isn't just in the type of energy because electricity is more a carrier of energy than an actual source of energy. So that's not electricity, that's light. Light is a form of electricity. The, ele the electricity is just a wave that carries the, the energy. So you get heat, you get light, you get motion, those are energy. So electricity is not just a change in the, 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 the fuel, but it's a change in the, the system itself. It's one of these radical, it's like from the, the landline phone to an information system. It's that kind of change. So the reason I, I mention this is because Servicool says it always takes long and it's always complicated, but then we have this magnificent example of a change very, very quickly. However, that second industrial revolution, um, if you look at the electricity systems that we've got today, so just, and I'm going to just do a little aside. I could do the same for transport and for a lot of things, but I'm going to stick to electricity from now. We can talk about cars and whatever later. But I'm going to talk about electricity. I'll tell you why. Because I do think that internal combustion engines will be replaced by electric vehicles. So I think the big debate about the oil industry and, and its emissions and everything, it's going to be leapfrogged by this electric vehicle thing. So that's my personal belief. Some people might disagree, and it'll be nice to debate it a little bit at the end, just to raise the questions. Okay, so that's why I'm putting transport aside, just to... to um, so sticking to electricity, getting back to electricity. This, the basic system that Ed, using Edison and Nikola Tesla's technologies that came up in the 1880s and 1890s, in other words, a big st steam turbine and electricity flowing in one direction from that big generator to all the, the uses uh, that electricity has. And there have been two, there was another um, industrial revolution after that, which was also electricity driven, which is information technology. But sticking with the second one, um, the system has these big centralized generators, one direction flow of power to users. So the, the, the principles didn't change. The steam generators just got bigger, the gas turbines got bigger, the generators got bigger, the, the transmission lines got bigger, but it was a flow from these centralized systems outwards. Also, it didn't change much. There was a shift, some shift to nuclear, which was small, not, apart from some countries like France that has got 70% nuclear, but it's, it's a small amount of total electricity. By now even, and you'll see, I'll show you a graph, um, oh, there's a shift to gas turbines. So gas turbines, what that means is instead of using gas or oil or coal to create steam, which then turns a turbine, with gas turbines, you just shoot the gas straight into the turbine, like a jet. It's a jet engine. That's what gas turbines are. So that, and they're used hugely in electricity production. So apart from a shift to a bit to nuclear and gas turbines, we still have huge fossil-based generators sending electricity on big systems. It's just bigger. It's the same system. No radical change in energy systems. So the basics are fossil-driven turbines, centralized system, and similar story with transport. But our lecture's not long enough to deal with everything. So this graph, and let me just look how much time we have, because I don't have a watch on me. 25 to go. Okay. We want to have at least 10 minutes for 
chat. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to just do a little more stuff, and then maybe we can go to questions. So I just want to show you, uh, this is from the BP, um, they're no longer called British Petroleum, they're just called BP, um, statistical review of world energy. They've been coming out for 30 years. They're probably one of the best resources free on the web. This is on, it's the global primary energy consumption. Um, so the bottom axis, that's 2017, 2007, 1993. And what you'll notice is that if you look, look at oil, it's still the biggest. Um, then there's natural gas. Well, it's about the same size as coal or maybe biggest. Um, then there's natural gas. So these are the fossils, by far the biggest amount of primary energy used. Oh, sorry, plus coal. Those are, so fossils just completely dominate our energy system. And remember, burning all of those causes greenhouse gases. They're the primary cause of the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change. And then if you look at renewables, that's them there. And when we say renewables, they're, they're, those are new renewables, which is not hydro. So it's mainly wind and solar. Um, and then there's nuclear there. So why, it, this is this thing about, you'll see now, one has to end up being schizophrenic in this business about, is there, because if you look at the newspapers, everybody would tell you, we're in the middle of a massive energy transition. But those all look like pretty straight graphs to me. Same trend, or BP's lying, or whatever, but I don't think so. And interestingly, the CEO, Group Chief Executive Bob Dudley, from the report, the foreword to that says, in recent years, there's been no improvement in the mix of fuels feeding the global power sector. That means the electricity production sector. Astonishingly, the share of coal in 2017 was actually the same as in 1998. So I'm sorry to tell you this, because I would really like to tell you that we're in the midst of a huge transition and we're going to do climate change. Uh, most of us probably won't be there for it, but certainly my daughter is very right to be very unimpressed with this kind of world that we're handing over, in my view, anyway. So he says that the share of non-fossil fuels was actually lower, basically because there was a decline in the nuclear industry, and that was for, you know, spurred by Fukushima, and then the Germans, because of Fukushima, switching off their nuclear power. So it's he says here there's a failure to make any inroads into the power sector since the turn of the century. It's a phenomenal statement if you read The Guardian every day. Um, so that's, don't look so happy. <laughs> so is the BP story the whole story? So this is from a, a, a brilliant renewables policy group called the Renewable Energy Policy Network. And this is their REN21 status report. And they confirm this. They say that this is the primary energy, 80%. And then this is renewables, but interestingly, even worse, if you look at what renewables are made up of, traditional biomass is about 8%. Then there's this, but it's mainly hydropower and biomass solar geothermal heat. New renewables, in other words, wind, solar, and biomass, modern renewables, is that very unfortunate 1.7% there. And this is from REN21. Anyway, I I was horrified to see this when I looked at it today. I think when I read it, I'll then ignore it because... OK, now I'm just going to... Two more things. Those are the emissions. This is what I talked about at the beginning. If we want a two-degree world, we've got to cut them down like that. And they're just going up. And this is from Shell, another oil company. So I use REN21, oil companies, all kinds. This is what we've got to do. We've got to do this with renewables. So this is what the transition has to look like. But we, we do know we've got the technologies, wind, solar, etc. but we know it's not happening much. Um, and this is another thing. I'm just going to go quickly now. This is what we have to do. All these graphs that we're used to seeing, that much more, much more, much more. And then another view of transitions. You could say transitions are about we must just take that old system and put some new components in. Or you could say it's about this, and this is from, I think, PwC. 
I do like, I should put my sources on. So it's from one of the big consultancies. And they're saying, and I'll show you a few more now, that the transition is much more about, I had the very good fortune to meet, his name's Hans Josef, and I've forgotten, I can't say his surname, he's German. He was a, a, one of the leaders in the Green Party that got the Germany energy vendor going. And he came to South Africa, and I met him. He gave a talk, and I went and spoke to him afterwards. And I said to him, can you tell me, um, how did you get the, the energy vendor and this energy transition going in Germany? You do know that Germany now can produce all of its power from renewables if it's a nice, sunny, windy day. So there is good news. It's possible. But Hans Josef told me, I said, how did you do it? And he said, we just worked very, very hard for 30 years. <laughs> and he was talking about political opposition, complexity, a whole lot of stuff. So these, this is what the consultancies are saying. Firstly, decentralization. Big centralized systems, unfortunately, are in the hands of the incumbents. And if you own a pile of coal mines and you're feeding it into coal stations and you just happen to be friendly with the president, which somehow or other the Koch brothers and the, all the owners of coal mines and oil facilities in the world are friends of the president. So if you look at what's happening in Australia uh, energy policy or Canadian energy policy or US energy policy, um, they're these people that have captured the state. It's not just South Africa. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a universal problem that very centralized energy industries, by their very nature, will not be part of the transition. So there's decentralization, democratization. So it's the people that are going to suffer from climate change that have to be involved. This is very, very encouraging, digitalization, because it's truly enabling amazing things. And we could talk about technology forever. And of course, decarbonization. We have to be utterly dedicated to it, else it won't happen, because it's not happening, even though we've known it has had to happen for a long time. So what is decentralization? This is a very nice picture. Type in Meridian Economics. You'll find it on the web. It's a local man called Dr. Javier Skane. This is his picture. But this is the system that I've said we've had since Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison put it together. You have a big power station, and power flows one way to everybody. This is what I believe will save us, and that is a whole lot of what are called prosumers on a smart grid with energy flowing in a whole lot of directions. I'm also very optimistic about this um, because I'm just going to... There are things like this. This is called the Google Nest. It's a little piece of silicon. They know power... It's equivalent already to many, 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 many power stations. All it does is automatically set the power... Uh, appliances in your home. It's connected to your smartphone, it knows where you are, and they avoid burning a lot of coal. So that's the, one of the digitalization examples. Um, so I'm just going to quickly say that all the big, these Deloitte's says the power market in 10 years, this will be a different place, they're sure. Uh, PwC, same things, they're called megatrends and disruptions. The megatrends are and this is what my belief is, but also Schumpeter tells us we never know what's going to happen. S solar photovoltaic panels are already producing electric power at below the cost of new power stations, coal power stations. And it's going down fast, and I could have shown you all these graphs, and we never know what's going to happen in the future, but s solar PV is already below the operational cost of some South African stations, and I think it's going to go below the operational costs of coal. So when that happens, things change a lot. These are, that's a disruption. It's not what you plan. You have to get ready for it, though. Um, the other thing is battery technology. So we, the, I've got another slide here. Um, we nearly finished. So, we, so this is a whole lot of, I call these people, it's not the greenies, it's renewable energy proponents, these wise Mine, so it's a bunch of old grey beards and grey tops. But they say things like this. We're in the midst of the biggest technological revolution. The energy system is changing at a pace not seen since the dawn. Firms do not have five, ten years, etc., etc. And I think it's driven by this. 
So this is in South Australia, and already a battery plus solar unsubsidized is cheaper than the grid, the commercial grid. And that's going to turn everything on its head. And then um, the other thing that's going to turn everything on its head is this. So that uses probably about a thousand of the power of that, or maybe a hundredth, but it produces the same amount of light. Um, so it's not only on the production side of electricity, but it's on the consume, consumption side. That, and it's the same with electric vehicles. An internal combustion engine is 25% efficient. An electric motor can be 95% efficient. So on the efficiency side, on the use side, and the same goes for a whole lot of other technologies. We're getting very clever in using energy as well. Also, insulation is a magnificent thing. So, that just represents energy efficiency and the huge uh, increases that's happening in that. And then this is here in South Africa, that's in Randburg. Those people put that one megawatt solar panel on their roof because it's making them money today and prices are dropping fast. So those things are just... It's sort of, government is sort of in the same position as Joanna Macy was saying. They're also in grief and denial because their electricity, well, our electricity systems, as it turns out, in South Africa are owned by government because ours are all owned by government. They're not financially viable because of that and batteries. Are we going to see a huge change coming? I think I should just leave it there because so we've got time for questions. Oh, this. So, also, you're welcome to have this um, presentation. I don't know what the summer school does. Okay. I'll leave it on your machine. That's big, 16 megabytes. So, uh, and just as far as that goes, if you Google um, these things, you'll see they just... There used to be three or four years ago a few of these. There's just a flood of them now um, from conventional mainstream thinkers. Okay, I like that. <laughs> uh, a boat? Fantastic. A oh, sailboat to electric. Probably 70, 75 meters, maybe. There's enough hydrocarbons in there. Um, but what, my question really is, is, how does this fit in to your scheme? Because if we can use waste that we generate, that's also a renewable, surely. Absolutely. So just a very quick answer to that. So the way that I think about that is we do models all the time. And on the left-hand side that I think, we look at all our resources. On the right-hand side, we have the demand for energy. And in the middle, we have how do we turn the resources into demand? So on the resource side, what we've got to do is count the resources. So we say we've got 50 billion tons of coal, but unfortunately, if we burn that, we're going to fry the planet. So we cross that one out and say we're going to phase it out. And then we look at phasing it out. When we look at biogas, we say this is how much waste there is. Methane comes from organic matter. Um, so, and the, the, so I don't want to, and yes, it's a big resource, but when you look at it compared with other resources, say with PV or wind or gas, but just the renewable ones, PV or wind, it's very small. Not, that does not mean that we shouldn't use it because there are two reasons to use it. One, the methane that comes from organic waste that is put into a landfill and not managed is a terrible greenhouse gas. It's 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So I'm a, my partner is a zero waste zealot. So we're not allowed to use plastic bags and etc. etc. and I'm completely supportive. 
So, yes, we must recycle and we must use all of our waste, but the best place actually for your waste is in your compost heap without methane uh, production to make food so that you don't go to the supermarket to buy vegetables, in my view. But while we've got bigger and bigger and bigger cities and people can't, don't have compost heaps, they can manage the landfills, and South Africa already has one of those sites working in Durban. So they retrofitted... A, a, a waste dump, they put a dome over it, they capture the methane and they use it to generate some electricity and also to generate some heat because directly. But it's a small resource given the huge amount of energy we kind of have to have to maintain our modern cities. I don't know how to do that order here, do you want to help me? I think it's going to be better. So the, the, the biggest scale electricity storage is hydro storage, so that's pumped storage. That's pretty simple. We've got a few of those in South Africa. Um, other large scale is they compress air down a mine. It's amazingly efficient, compressing air and then driving a turbine. Um, but so, so if it's solar panels, what we're really looking at there, that plus the battery, Looking at battery costs, they haven't got there yet, but there's a strong indication that batteries, surprisingly, are going, batteries plus solar panels are going to be a lower cost than our current coal-fired power stations. They've already, there's this grid parity idea, but you're asking about large scale. So large scale batteries is probably where it's going. This, I, would, um, I was just trying to think what other, Okay so, okay, so that's as much as I know in the short term about large-scale storage. Concentrated solar power, just for people that don't know what that is, what you do is, okay, there are two types. There's one called a parabolic trough. It's a mirror. The other one, and it's a long parabolic trough, and you have a tube down the middle of it, and they put molten salt down there, or uh, no, they actually put water down there, and they boil it using the mirror. The other one is 10,000 mirrors all shining on a central point, heats up molten salt that stores it. And this is the good thing about the molten salt centralized system because when the sun goes down at night, you can take that molten salt and continue driving steam turbines, the same as conventional power stations. South Africa's recently commissioned two... Exactly. And at the moment... It's coming in at about three or four rand a kilowatt hour compared to new coal, which is about one rand sixty compared to old coal, which is about 80 cents. Um, we do know that if you spend a lot of money on research and you build a lot more of these things, there's something called a learning curve. And it could be if we, if, if we, buy, if we get government to buy a lot of CSP plants, we can push ourselves down that learning curve. One of the exciting things about CSP, and we have an excellent CSP uh, world-leading researchers at Stellenbosch University, um, uh, and you can go and see their facilities there uh, and look them up on the internet. But one of the most exciting things about CSP is for climate change and for emissions, we've been talking about electricity, but when you look at future models, one of our, the hardest nuts to crack is people using coal directly in small-scale industry for heat. And it's difficult to get those people to swap because it's so cheap, because there are no efficiency losses when you use coal directly for thermal energy, which they are when you use it to convert it into electricity. So um, to get those factories or small facilities to change from coal, CSP is offering, and, and Stellenbosch is doing work on industrial CSP. So you'd have a small-scale CSP plant for uh, a, a factory or, or industrial area, and you don't convert it into electricity first.
Um, okay, so there are two questions there, the plowing money into ESKIM and subsidizing PV ins installations. I'll do the, the second one first, because um, PV has reached a stage where if you compare it with other new technologies, it's price competitive. And it also is complementary with wind.